There have been so many changes in the last generation that we have to study some of the new situations that have arisen in order to find keys to the peculiar tensions and stress of the present day. I think one thing we can almost all remember, and that is that we were brought up in a smaller world than we live in today. We were brought up in a, a world in which the private problems of the citizen occupied the greater part of his time and attention. He was neither equipped nor inclined to take on responsibilities that were utterly beyond him. He recognized certain limitations and had a modesty about his own knowledge which has almost completely disappeared. He realized that all of the larger responsibilities of society had to be in the keeping of experts and specialists in these areas, and he was simply not qualified the past judgment. Today you can hardly find anyone who does not regard himself as lacking qualification to pass judgment on everything, everyone, and every situation that arises. Uh, we have a certain sense of moral obligation to have opinions. Whether we are informed is not important. We have come to the conclusion that everyone's opinion is as good as everyone else's, and I guess in sober fact that's about the truth of the matter. We have very little sense of the danger of allowing our world to become too big for us. This has happened. Our freeways are too fast for us. Uh, world news, world events are too complicated for us. The so-called progress of society is too much for us in a great many uh, areas of living. We are struggling, we are hoping to make it. But in the meantime, we are whipping the nervous system almost more than our economy can sustain. Every neurologist, every specialist in fields of human health is aware that modern man is developing a collective fatigue mechanism. He is born tired, and people who are tired become very easily irritable, and from fatigue arises faulty judgment, and from the mistakes we make naturally must arise powerful defense mechanisms to say nothing of the waste of energy and time required to correct these mistakes. So today we are a very much fatigued people. We are expected to be informed on almost every subject. We also have a feeling that comes with fatigue of irritability. We are unable to carry the small problems of life with gentility. We cannot have a debate without it becoming an unpleasant scene. We cannot discuss any subject without making enemies. We can pass no opinion without someone rising up in righteous indignation to declare that they object. There seems to be no reason for much of this. Uh, there seems to be only an exhaustion, an irritability. And out of this irritability, there arises the causes of feud and of very serious national and international problems. So I think we must, uh, this evening, consider something of a philosophy of man's adjustment with his world. 
The first question that arises, I think, is, can anybody except a moron adjust presently to existing conditions? Yes, I think that probably any individual can improve his adjustment through a very quiet analysis of himself. I do believe that it is possible for the individual to transcend pressures of almost any degree that are exerted against him. I say it is possible, although very few of us will ever be able to do it in a big way. Actually, man has the power within himself to protect himself against any circumstance exterior to himself. And if he had the wisdom, if he had the skill, the foresight, he could eliminate from his life most of the disasters through which he would pass. That such a possibility exists would be well within the spirit of Zen. Also, then would affirm definitely that the individual can achieve adjustment without becoming negative or unrealistic or without denying the experiences that go on around him. The individual can achieve the condition of being able to learn without pain. If he can achieve it, then it would seem that there are many inducements today for him to attain this desired goal. There are many inducements, and there always have been. But between the individual and this attainment, uh, there lies a distance or an interval which he has consistently refused to cross from the very beginning of his experience as a human being. One of the things that we can learn from going back over history is that the average person has never been able to reach a point in his development in which he could rise above the pressures of his own disposition. He has never been able to be right for the sake of being right. He has never been able to overcome the combativeness and the belligerence of his own nature. And after thousands of years of war, we still have war. Because man, basically, is unable to experience the benefits of peace. There was an article in the paper a few days ago in an effort to defend the fact that war is inevitable, that there can never be a lasting peace so long as the world is populated by the kind of creatures that live in it now. This is faulty thinking, but it is certainly based upon a long record of man's attitude. It seems that the more we do to enlighten the individual, the more he misuses his enlightenment. He uses the increased skills which he attains to lock himself still more desperately in conflict with his fellow men. And in the last 50 years, our knowledge has increased, our standards of education have increased, our economic levels of function have increased. Everything has increased except good nature. And that is one of the first victims of progress. We have lost kindliness in the process of attempting to attain skill. So Zen takes the ground that man himself is capable of determining how he will react to pressures outside of his own nature. 
he can control any pressure that does not control him. And no pressure can control him unless he permits it to. And the reason that most pressures control people is because secretly the people themselves uh, rather like the pressures or find in the pressures a way of gratifying some selfishness of their own. So we start now by trying to work through the formula of man's effort to escape pressure without isolating his own nature, sort of insulation without isolation, perhaps. Actually, we can accept into our own nature anything that we wish to allow to pass the censorship of our thoughts and emotions. If our emotions say, yes, this is desirable, we acknowledge this desirable thing and accept it as an experience of consciousness. The same is true of the mind. If, therefore, we are naturally selfish, we accept selfish pressures from outside. If we are naturally emotional, ambitious, we allow ourselves to become the victims of the ambition pressures around us. But we have to sell out first. The individual cannot be contaminated or injured by a pressure which he will not accept. Now, in addition to this problem of pressures, which he will or will not accept, we have to also realize that pressure is not necessarily the intensity of the outside circumstance. Pressure is the intensity of man's reaction to it. Now, we can say, for example, that a freeway exerts a terrible pressure upon the individual. Actually, however, it probably does not exert this pressure. The pressure arises within the individual. It arises because he himself is inadequate. His heart begins to pound because he is afraid of situations. He realizes that in this tremendously intense situation, many persons not too skillful, are at the wheels of deadly weapons. He is an, a frightened, he is worried, and he becomes tense and becomes himself a very dangerous element in the pattern. I think we would find that under hypnosis, this same individual would be able to drive the freeway with full alertness of his sensory perceptions and no marked increase of his nervous reflexes or his cardiac rate. We would find that this tension arises from a series of psychochemical factors within himself. Also, if this person, for any reason or other, felt that at a certain time his reflexes were not adequate, he can always get off of the freeway. He does not have to fight the thing to the end as we seem to feel it necessary to struggle against pressures until they destroy us. Pressures, therefore, represent the actions of other people. And there's an interesting possibility to assume that our reaction to pressure is largely karmic. We accept the pressures we deserve just as we accept everything else in life that uh, comes in because of our own uh, constitution. Therefore, the way in which we react to the intensities of civilization, of world events, and the degree to which we permit these things to trouble and destroy us, uh, this whole chemistry is karmic. It is the weakness, inadequacy, inability in ourselves that causes us uh, to achieve only confusion as a result of pressure. Now we can say definitely that in order to escape this pressureful circumstance, 
more is required merely than to lock the individual attitude against pressure. The person who says to himself, I want to live a less pressureful existence, must set the law of karma operating in the direction which he requires. In order to experience less pressure, he must cause less pressure. In order to be free from pressure around him, he must relieve himself of the pressure within him. He must cause adjustment rather than confusion. He must cause an harmonious relationship between himself and life rather than the intense relationship which he now experiences. How can he do this? In the first place, he can begin to investigate his own psychic integration. He can realize that he is tired. But why is he tired? Is he actually tired because of the exhaustion of his employment? Is he really fatigued because of the newspaper and the television? Is he actually worn out by the uncertainties of international relationships? Usually these so-called outside causes are excuses rather than reasons. He is actually inwardly fatigued for lack of the integration of his own nature. He is inwardly fatigued because he has not brought his own appetites and instincts within the control of common sense. For example, one reason why he may be terribly nervous and tense is debt. And why is he in debt? Because he has spent more than he has. Also, he can say emergencies force him to do this. If emergencies forced him to do this, then it almost, it's almost certain that he was not prepared for emergencies. Now, it's hard to be prepared for emergencies today, but it is still harder when you live beyond your means every day. The individual is in trouble, is in tension, and is uh, in under stress very often simply because he has lived poorly, because he is not doing the things that need doing and he is not following common sense procedures himself. Another great cause of pressure and tension, of course, is personality conflict. And the person should ask himself occasionally, why am I under such constant personality stress? Is it because I am trying to defend the fact that I am always right? when the obvious proof is so much against me that I'm merely a nervous wreck trying to maintain my end of the argument. Actually, the individual who is unable to admit defeat in these things, who is struggling desperately to preserve an image, both for himself and for others, which he cannot maintain, is naturally under tremendous pressure. If this same person finding themselves in an embarrassing situation due to their own mistakes, would simply smile and say, well, I guess I was wrong. There's no tension building. But if the person refuses to admit this, he most certainly will try to shift the blame. When he does that, he enrages other people. And very soon a great deal of tension arises, and this is what happens between nations and causes war. So wherever the individual is under tension because he is living a code of pretensions, one way is to reduce tension is to stop pretending. Just simply acknowledge uh, that we cannot, any of us, always be right. Nature has given us two tremendous escape mechanisms to help us to work with tension. One is laughter and the other is tears. Both of these will break tension. Now, tears are usually a rather unhappy way of doing it, because the individual is either very sorry for something or very sorry for himself by the time tears set in. But laughter is always a happy way of breaking tension. And the fastest and best way we know of of breaking a tense situation is to be able to laugh at our own mistakes. 
laugh at ourselves rather than other people. When we no longer take ourselves with such desperate seriousness, we do not have to defend an indefensible situation. So we go on down examining one little pattern after another to find out why these tensions close in on us. I know people who have almost died of freeway-itis in the last few years. They are fighting freeways morning and night. They are trying desperately to get somewhere and perhaps risking their lives. I've asked these individuals why it wouldn't be better for them to start 10 minutes earlier or 15 minutes earlier and perhaps go on a less speedy road or else at least not be in such a desperate rush to get somewhere. Most of the individuals simply can't even conceive starting a little sooner. This is beyond them. If they start a little sooner, they will have to eat breakfast a little sooner. They'll have to get up five minutes sooner or ten minutes. And it all adds up to an impossible situation. The only answer is to get behind the wheel and try the best you can to get there on time when you start late. If you can do that, you're a success. And people feel this is necessary. Uh, the old story, of course, on this, that I think is a classic, is when Wong Chung, the great Chinese statesman, rode on an express train with President Ulysses S. Grant when the train was making a record-breaking run between Washington and Chicago. Grant was walking around, the old-fashioned gold watch in his hand, watching the record being broken. And the Chinese statesman was sitting blandly uh, watching the American president. Suddenly, Grant snapped the watch shut, turned to the Chinese and said, Early, we've done it. We've made this trip in ten minutes less than it was ever made before. The old Chinaman smiled and said, Yes, Mr. President, now what do we do with the ten minutes? <laughs> no one had any answer for that one. Yet we are killing ourselves for lack of that answer every day right here in this generation. We are allowing our bodies and our minds and our emotions to take an unnecessary beating simply for reasons of this kind. Another beating that we are taking and giving is alcohol. The desperate effort to stimulate or hold up or relax or do something causes the individual to endanger his health and, utterly, and, and ultimately become the victim of more serious and desperate situations simply because he feels he must find some way of letting down without changing his habits. His solution is instead of changing the bad habits that he already has, add another one to them. This will really accomplish something. So more health is undermined, more energy is torn down. Another problem that is hurting most people at the moment very much is this desperate effort for complete freedom of life. The individual wishes to do only exactly what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. And any interference becomes a desperate cause of anxiety, of resentment, frustration, and neurotic pressure. Now it happens in this world that no one can ever do exactly what they want to do all the time, or even most of the time. We have moments of reward in which our little hopes and little wishes are gratified. But society consists of persons, all of whom must sacrifice something of their own privileges in order to create a cultural civilization. Civilization is built upon sacrifice, the sacrifice of rugged individualism to the common needs of society. And the individual who is unwilling to adjust, to give up anything of himself, the individual who would almost rather die than compliment another person, 
individual who must always find something the matter with what other people do, must live only to condemn, to criticize, to tear down. The individual who cannot permit any other person to have the privileges that that same individual claims for himself. This is a cause of tension, a cause of great frustration. We have people coming all the time who are totally defeated because they cannot do exactly what they please. Many of these people have assumed responsibilities. Now they resent those. The individual who bought the house now resents the fact that the monthly payments are of such size that he cannot take extravagant vacations somewhere else. He cannot spend the same money two or three times. And out of this situation, he actually goes into an emotional decline. He cannot follow through even the responsibilities to which he has committed his own life. His responsibilities to a family, his responsibilities to children, his responsibilities to his business and his job. These weigh heavily upon him, for every responsibility is a restriction upon total freedom. And the individual is struggling for total freedom. And what does he get out of total freedom? He gets the same mysterious thing that happens when the watch in a, ma a mainspring in a watch breaks. When there is no longer any resistance, when there is no longer anything which the spring is driving or pulling or pushing, the spring goes wild, and the individual goes wild. Instead of having freedom, he comes in the end to complete mental and emotional confusion. For our responsibilities are some of the most normalizing forces in our lives. One by one, we can c consider all of the different things that people do to make life hard for themselves. And when we get the pattern all put together, we realize that it's hardly necessary for society itself to contribute anything. We can become nervous wrecks all by ourselves. But it is our tendency immediately to blame other conditions for our troubles. This evasion of personal self-analysis, this evasion of the willingness to sit down and think through our own mistakes, is one of the reasons why we do not see the operation of the law of karma as a just process in our own a daily experience. Supposing we begin lowering these pressures by a distinct and definite determination of our own. Supposing we gradually work our way through careful planning into a condition or position in which we are dependent to a minimum degree only upon any circumstance outside of ourselves, that we are going to live so carefully, so wisely, so justly in our own relationships that we are going to give other persons no just cause uh, to be displeased with us, and we are going to give ourselves no unnecessary burdens or responsibilities out of foolishness, selfishness, or stupidity. Now this doesn't mean that we can end all suffering, but we certainly can reduce it. We can reduce it to an endurable degree in which it will no longer bind our own attitude. The confused person loses the orientation which provides him with a philosophy for living. The confused person doubts God, man, and the universe. And he has a tendency to assume that everyone else is as confused as he is. And if he cannot put the universe in order, he is inclined to believe it cannot be put in order. Thus, his own personal confusions lead to materialistic attitudes, atheism, agnosticism, and the like. And he comes more and more 
into a completely negative relationship with life. The first thing we can do, or should do, therefore, is to try to get ourselves out of this mysterious situation in which we have become involved through bad education, through false attitudes, through the stimulation of false appetites, to a completely inadequate general psychology of life. We simply have allowed ourselves to deteriorate. We have to correct this because otherwise no amount of social reform can save us from ourselves. We can have everything that we can dream of today we will still be in the same situation because we'll start other dreams even more fantastic. Then comes into this by also pointing out the great difficulty of a person trying to work with the confused psychic nature within him. When we turn within ourselves and find a world of absolute nightmare, a fantasy that makes no sense, when we look inside of our own nature and find a mass of uncontrollable factors, we hardly have any concept of how to control them. We have the feeling that by the time we correct one fault, ten others will have destroyed us. There seems to be no place to start when we really become aware of our own mistakes we suddenly discover how many faults we can and do possess. Uh, while we have denied any of them and all of them, we seem to be pretty highly advanced people. But when we face the fact, it's very disillusioning. Zim tells us that you cannot solve the problem, therefore, by going into yourself and trying desperately to reform each of the little separate impulses that is annoying you. You can keep this on forever, and you will still never reach integration. Because even if you browbeat some fault into submission, this does not mean that the fault, even though submissive, actually makes a valid contribution to integration or true cooperation. It is like a police state, a dictatorship. If the world dictates the control of the emotions and thoughts, you have no voluntary friendship between them. You have no cheerful cooperation, but only a sullen state of suspended rebellion. Rindman takes the attitude that there's not, this is not the way to do it. Uh, that is, we have to fight with ourselves against every negative situation that arises we will again be locked in conflict to the very end. Maybe a noble war, we may go down to a magnificent defeat, but we're not going to win. So Zen tells us that all of these faults exist and are annoying because they are sustained by mental or emotional energy. A very small group of basic energy attitudes supplies or supplies the energy for all kinds of selfish and perverse attitudes. All of these come, for instance, or nearly all of them come from self-will, which is one definite drive. And this drive manifests to an infinitude of minor uh, types and kinds of self-willfulness. But behind all of it is selfishness and egotism and a certain willful perversity. And behind uh, almost all of our faults, there are a few powerful, unreasonable, irrational intensities. Then takes the attitude to reduce the energy allotment available to perpetuate attitudes. Then takes the ground that the only way you can have energy is to save it. And to save energy, you have got to reduce uh, the pressures uh, by which your Western nature is likely to be upset. The Western person believes in pressure. He believes pressures make life. He believes that life is nothing more or less than a continuous manifestation of energy. 
The individual who keeps quiet is dead. We must keep right on to the very last, dashing toward something, even though it is only the open grave. The Zen thinker does not regard this visible, symbolic exertion of energy as a symbol of aliveness. He does not believe that we must sell ourselves the idea that we are healthy because we are always up to our neck in exhaustion. That we must be warriors, we must be profoundly concerned about things we know nothing of in order to prove that we are mature, thoughtful people. All we really prove is that we are very ignorant people. Because our various formulas do not work, our solutions solve nothing, and our opinions are valueless to ourselves and others. So this cannot be the best answer. Suppose instead of this, we work for a quieting down of the entire inner life. But we work for a kind of retrospective mood the mood of tranquility. But we gain this mood of tranquility by devoting a little of our time simply to unwinding, as Zen calls it, unknotting. That instead of sitting around tying knots in ourselves, we go to a quiet place somewhere and slowly and quietly untie the knots. That we realize that Every one of the tension patterns that we build can be changed, can be modified, if we will simply, quietly reverse the processes within ourselves. It is perfectly possible to reverse these processes. So we have to find out how and learn a little of the experience of what happens when we do. For experience in all Eastern philosophy is the final selling agent. We become convinced it is true because it works, and not because anyone says it does. Let us imagine, then, the process of a knotting for the individual. Realizing, first of all, however, that you must be prepared for one psychic shock. Western man, when he begins to relax, thinks he is dying. He thinks he is falling apart completely. He does not believe that he will ever be able to crawl to the door. To him, relaxation is an anticipation of death. He suddenly discovers or feels as though he discovered that his heart had stopped that everything was turning into a dull gray haze, or that he was sick. So he dashes out and gets a drink or goes to his doctor for a shot or something. The mere fact that he is relaxing seems to him to be the most terrible symptom he ever faced. This shows you just how desperately ill man can get out of tension. He believes desperately that if he is not deeply agitated about something every moment, that he is losing his mind. How can anyone live in a mess like this without being a wreck? It is a moral duty to be a wreck, to show that you are sincerely concerned about the troubles of humanity. You do not realize that by being a wreck, you simply add to the troubles of humanity. That we don't get around to. So be prepared for that terrible moment when you are not sure whether you are on your way to heaven or to complete dissolution in space. In all probabilities, you are simply experiencing for the first time, perhaps in the entire mature length of your life, freedom from the desperate determination to be doing something. I had a grandmother who had that ailment really magnificently. She was always doing something. And she loved to sweep with an old Brussels carpet sweeper, which was all they had in her day. And she'd sweep the house from end to end. 
He came through it like a whirlwind and looked around and saw nothing left to sweep. If she was a woman who wanted something to do, if she quietly opened the carpet sweep, but took out a handful of the dust, threw it back on the rug and started over again. And she did this, of course, when apparently no one was watching. She didn't want to fool anyone else, but she was trying to fool herself. But this is a, very largely what people do, not quite so obviously, perhaps. But the individual who feels for a moment that he's not under tension is likely to jump in a car and drive somewhere, or he's liable to turn on a television program which has a fine group of crime factors in it, and go into another kind of nervous wreck watching it. To quiet down, to let down, is almost, is almost dangerous to him. Western man has never been able to relax. And out of his pensions, he's had one of the most tragic histories recorded in the entire story of our world's development. So let's imagine you are resolved. So you now begin to realize that this tension is not solutional of anything. If by being a nervous wreck you were helping somebody, it would be a tremendous incentive. Well, of course, you are helping certain people, the physician and the undertaker, but generally he gets along fairly well anyway. There is no real good being done. You are not helping yourself, you are not getting anywhere. You are simply wearing out a machine that has a limited capacity. If you wear it out, you no longer enjoy its co cooperative function. Third, looking for the effortless activities of life. When effortless, I don't mean that uh, they are complete suspension of all activity, but they are the su suspension of all tension, quietude, uh, gentleness of thinking, gentleness of action, the discovery gradually of quiet activities. Quiet activities that do not fight upon you as the ones that you have generally indulged in. Gradually sense within yourself a lowering of the combative egoism which most people depend on for vitality. Sit quietly and experience yourself as no longer desperately concerned with everything around you. Observe yourself as a detached being, a being in a state of quietude, as old Daruma wrapped up in his mantle in the Zen legend. Just quietly take a few minutes once in a while to start with and let go inside yourself, unwind yourself. Just feel beneath and behind these tensions. Now, one way of doing it is to be rather quiet and then begin with a simple symbolism, the opening and closing of your eyes. Opening of the eye creates objectivity and relationship. The individual who opens his eyes becomes in that action a citizen of the universe of environment, the things around him. When he closes his eyes, he no longer is a citizen of a universe of visual phenomena, which is the universe most real to us. For sounds still endure, but we are more affected by sight than by sound. Fifty percent of our attention will relax by the mere process of closing the eyes. In this sense of the word, just quietly close the eyes, and in so doing, you close symbolically uh, your intimate association with the world of people, of things, of possession. If your eyes are closed, uh, you are making a statement of non-acceptance of phenomena. Now, this isn't a rejection. This is not a process of denying the reality of the world or of its problems. 
It is merely the affirming that by the control of your own senses you can determine how much of the world you are going to let in at any time and how much you are going to keep out. Now the purpose of the course is not to keep out all of the world. The purpose, however, is to let in only what you can handle. Not to let in from the outside more than you can control by your own intelligence. If you let in too much, you then enter a state of confusion. Not to let in enough is to deprive yourself of the opportunities for growth through the understanding of phenomena. But our eyes are intended to provide us with experience. They are not intended to provide us with chaos. So we can control the amount of the outside world that we will permit to enter into our consciousness at any given time. And we must never let more in than we can administer. The symbolical action of closing the eyes that brings with it usually a tremendous sense of relief. Meditation, of course, is a kind of waking sleeping. Meditation is a process of being consciously awake, but gradually separating yourself from the tremendous pressures of worldly attitudes. So meditation is possible only to the individual who is able to relax or reduce pressure tension, which he does at least symbolically by closing out this world of eternal turmoil uh, in which he materially lives. Having determined to accept only what can be administered, what can be controlled, the individual then realizes that there are two courses open to him. One is that he must shut out a great deal, or the other possibility is that he must control more, that he must call upon his resources to enable him to control experiences without pressure. The uh, Oriental has worked out some very interesting attitudes about these things. And I think that while it is in a world not too close to our primary interest, that we have to recognize uh, that Zen was for centuries uh, the philosophy of the Japanese soldier. The soldier was peculiarly close to Zen for the simple reason that he la lived a completely precarious existence. In the Japanese cult, a soldier had no life of his own. He was bound utterly to his master, to the prince or noble whom he served. At any word, at any moment, at any time, he must be prepared to give his life without question. He must have no attachment, no possession. He must have nothing which would cause him to swerve in his allegiance to his master. As a result of this particular type of thought, the soldiers turned to Zen, which was a philosophy of immediacy, a philosophy in which courage, sufficiency, the ability to meet the moment with every bit of resource that we possess rests in the fact that we live in the moment. But that in order to achieve this identity of immediacy, we must gradually shake loose all attitudes by means of which we would be bound to the preservation of our own lives. The Bible has a thought very much like this in it, by the way, about where it is stated that the man who tries to save his life shall lose it, but the one who shall lose his life in the service of truth shall have everlasting life. Now this is the thought underneath the problem. In Zen, it is the doctrine of the individual who has relieved himself so completely of all attachments that he can at any moment make the necessary decision of that moment without tension. 
without regret, without fear, without anxiety, without compromise. It would be impossible for the samurai to say to himself, I'm, shall, shall I weigh this emergency? Shall I decide whether it's more important to live or to die? This is not permitted of him. It is only permitted of him that he shall meet the emergency of the moment without any modification of attitude. Now, in the Zen for the non-military, in, in the philosophy of Zen, what we are working for in our escape from tension is immediacy, immediacy of consciousness. If we can achieve immediacy, and at the same time have within ourselves a fair code of conduct, immediacy will mean that we will immediately perform that action which is best. This requires not only the courage of the samurai code, but it implies that we must know what is best. And uh, nearly all religions and philosophies have worked with this problem, and they've all come to the final conclusion that the best is always that which is of the most complete good to the greatest number. Best is never gratification of self. Best is the clinging to principle, to the truth of the matter, to the fact of the matter, to the honor of the matter, to the integrity of the matter, and to the justice of the matter. Clinging to these factors immediately, without compromise, without anxiety, and without reservation. Tension is a tearing. It is the individual with divided allegiances. Wherever there is compromise within character, there is division of allegiance. Where the individual would like to follow a better course, but finds himself in the desperate situation of St. Paul, who says that whenever he would do good, evil was nigh unto him. Wherever the individual would say, yes, this is the honorable thing to do, but then pauses and says, but it will not be profitable. I will lose something by doing it. This would be the thing against which the samurai is warned. If it is the right thing to do, it must be done, regardless. And if it is done immediately, without evasion, without a long battle with self, it is then what might be termed an effortless effort. It is a complete action free from the exhaustion of resource by tension. Intensity, as Zen would say, therefore, is the energy for direct action. Tension arises from the evasion of direct action. Tension arises from compromise of some kind. The delaying of things in the hope of some more fortunate solution. The effort to buy off a problem <coughs> rather than to face it. A, de a de determination to hold on to some personal advantage, even though it interferes with the fulfillment of integrity. These compromises create division, discord, conflict. And where these come, the individual rapidly exhausts his energy resources. So we can say that in the Zen concept, Direct action comes from a simple code and a complete courage to live it. This simple code we all have in some form. The Christian has it in the Sermon on the Mount. The Orthodox Jew has it in the Ten Commandments of Moses. The Muslim has it in the Code of Muhammad. The Roman had it in the Justinian Code. Codes of honor. Codes of character and principle. And the Greek, of course, also had it in his simple statement, death before dishonor. It was a simple matter. Socrates lived his code. He died without tension, even though 
he was actually executed. He had no sense of pressure. He lived according to what he believed, refused to compromise his character or his creed, and died at peace with himself, therefore free of tension. We are not usually required to die for our convictions anymore, but we are often required to live for them and by them if we wish to attain integration. Then, by giving us this concept of the minimum of action and the minimum of energy uh, gives us the key to our own security. Supposing we are presented with a difficult situation in which there are tempting factors both ways. If we are not integrated, we will even regret any decision that we make. We will always wonder if we couldn't have gotten another nickel out of the deal some way. We will struggle and scheme to twist things or things around to make them a little more advantageous to ourselves. Here goes tremendous amounts of energy. But it requires very little energy in the presence of that which requires an affirmative answer. To simply say yes and live by it. Or if it requires a negative answer, say no and live by it. Here you have used very little energy, but you have made a final statement. You have set a situation in a pattern by which it may only require maintenance. And having us arrived at this, without regret, without remorse, without compromise, the yes or the no almost administers itself. It is when we begin to fail our own attitudes that they begin to fail us. If then in Zen we face the problems of tension, the first duty of Zen is to root out the tension, find out where they are and why they are and realize, as this ancient teaching points out, that the end of all confusion is direct decision, immediate decision, truthful decision, decision based upon all available judgment. Now sometimes, undoubtedly, the decisions that we make honestly and truthfully will be unpleasant to other people. This is one of the inevitable complexities of life. Many persons will resent our honesty. Of course, they will equally resent our dishonesty. Because individuals with such attitudes are going to resent anything and everything. But actually, one of the attitudes that arises with them is not only the simple fact of immediate, immediate decision. But the Zen thinker also begins to realize his relationships to other people. He realizes that he is not only required to be right, he is also required to be kind. And if he thinks things through, the right and the kind will be the same thing. If he is in trouble, it is largely because he has in the past compromised his standards of values. If he has done so, he must live with the consequences, but he must add no more of similar consequences. He must begin immediately uh, to make the decisions that are the best for him and the best for other people. Those around us cannot benefit from our confusion, nor is there any use in our concealing our own attitudes behind it. Ultimately, the good for all concerned must be the honest fact of the matter. Or to experience life here. But it does reject the fact that we have to accept materialism as valuable in itself. It is valuable only to the degree that it stimulates us to outgrow it. Consequently, the life in Zen 
must have its own order and its own interests and its own activities. What Zen would try to do is to give man a new life, a life in this world in which he makes use of the world but never abuses it, that he enjoys it but never attempts to control it, that he appreciates it without ever attempting to impose his own will upon it. Zen is based upon man's obedience to the natural laws of existence around him. Zen affirms that nature itself is all-sufficient and is a magnificent source of inspiration, of attainment, of beauty, of truth, and insight. Therefore, that man is not here to change the world, but to change himself. He is not here to rule the world or conquer the world. He is here to establish his own principles in himself, that he may become capable of living a good life wherever he is, in this world or anywhere else. Recognizing, as then must recognize, that man has two existences, one in this world and one as a citizen of eternity. The Zen thinker declares his allegiance to be with eternity that as long as eternity is in time and in condition and value infinitely more than the material world in which he lives, allegiance to it is infinitely wiser than allegiance to the transitory, inconsistent, the unsubstantial situation with which most persons make up their time. So Zen does not say, however, I'm going to walk out of the world because Zen believes definitely that eternity and time are in the same place. The quiet life lived peacefully is a life in eternity even though it is lived here. The individual who no longer creates discord experiences the peace of the universe while embodied in the mortal flesh. So the purpose is to make a new adjustment with eternal values. An, adjust, an adjustment which is no longer tension-ridden. An adjustment which is based upon an, a much more constructive attitude toward other people. And it's an adjustment which inspires rather than irritates those around us. I think then that for a Western man the, the problem is a very simple one. Taste is actually man's hurrying towards his own end. Why should we be in such a hurry? Why should we try desperately to make time pass? Why would, should we fill in every moment of it so that we will not notice that there is such a thing as time? Why should we kill time and forget that while we are doing it, time is killing us? Why is it that so many people are locked in a struggle against time? What to do with the ten minutes, which is going to be a burden unless we waste it? Why should we desperately take medication so that we will not be aware of time? Why should we try to sleep 24 hours a day as some neurotics do because they cannot even face the ordinary existences of a day. Why is it that this very precious, this very valuable thing, this allotment of existence that we have here, should be to so many persons a deadly enemy, so much an enemy that they would even commit suicide to dispose of their time allotment forever? At least they think so. Why should we be so desperately afraid of the 60 minutes that make up an hour and hope desperately that they will pass faster so that actually we will die the sooner. The only possible answer to that is that the person in himself has no good use to make of that time. 
what he wants to do is to work part of it so that he will not notice that it has passed. Then he wants to watch the ball game or the television or go out so that he will suddenly discover that he's been away from the house for four hours without realizing it. This is an achievement because he wanted to get rid of those four hours. He was afraid of them. Gurdon says that if all you can think of in connection with time is how quickly you can get rid of it, then there must be a terrible poverty in yourself. Because actually time is life. Time is opportunity. Time is privilege. Time is a span of sharing and giving and thinking and dreaming and hoping and fearing. And these things we do not dare to face. If we relax, then, we threaten ourselves with eternal boredom. We threaten ourselves with the condition of having nothing to do. Here is man, the noblest of the creatures, who has spent thousands of years trying to grow up from some prehistoric ancestor to the point where he is the noblest of all creatures and he is afraid of a half hour because he has nothing to do with it. Something has to be desperately amiss in this type of a pattern. And what it should tell everyone is that they have failed to mature themselves. They have failed to create inner life. And to create inner life is to create something within yourself that is with you all the time and makes existence not only pleasant but significant, every moment of it. It makes you perhaps a little begrudge the hours of sleep because they take you from experiences that are so worthwhile. To achieve this inner maturity of attitude, the Oriental turns to creative art, to creative thought, to poetry, to literature, to all the beautiful things that make up contemplative existence. He finds a wonderful wealth in the contemplative life. The life of contemplation is simply the life of constant acceptances. It is the accepting into self of the wonder of living, the wonder of life. It is to be forever uh, enthralled by universal beauty, to be constantly almost overwhelmed as the mystic was by the significance of life itself. In this there is simply no time, no opportunity, no need for all the self-pities and all the irritations and arguments with which we load our lives. But to do this, we must some way escape from the mediocre, from the, the constant patterns of meaninglessness, which have closed in around us and made every day like every other day. We can break this pattern if we want to. But to want to is the problem. We get tired, we get exhausted with things, we get bored, we give up. Zen tells us if we do this giving up long enough, then the exterior things move in upon us, creating this terrible tension, <coughs> creating this conflict with life, and gradually interfering with the basic functions of the body itself so that we shorten life and destroy the very consciousness that we are seeking to perfect. In, these, in the Zen way, we have such things as the tea ceremony, which in the West is a complete waste of time. We have flower arrangements. We have the exquisite poetry of the East, the great literature, we have the wonderful writing and painting. We have all kinds of quiet means of enjoying existence. Means that give much time for thoughtfulness. The Eastern Tea Ceremony reminds the mature, cultured person of the magnificent privilege 
of sharing some small fragment of life with friends. Over here, friends are people who can do us some good. Friends are people whom we hope we can borrow from, and more still, hope will not borrow from us. This has nothing to do with friendship at all. It's merely a convenience and has brought friendship to a low ebb, a low ebb with that Western man. Friends are the other selves with which we share our dreams. Friends are those who respect our silences. Friends are those whose thoughts reach out and mingle with ours across some quiet bridge of meditation. Friends are one soul in several bodies. Most of all, of all, they are fellow journeyers toward eternal peace, and their contributions are the contributions of gentleness, of appreciation, and of kindness. We can have friends without stress and without tension, but only if there is some deep meaning to life. We find, therefore, the eternal need for the building of code, for the building of meaning. And if we cannot find this meaning any other way, we have to build it in ourselves. And if at first we have to choose our friends from the stars or from the flowers of the fields or from the birds, we must find those friends with whom we have sympathy of soul. We have to also find expression in some great creativeness. It may be simple, but it must be a tribute. Our tribute to life is creative. And uh, we create through fulfilling. And we fulfill life by meeting all of its reasonable demands without tension. We take various areas of beauty and we perfect them. It is the same in raising children. Today, children are a great problem to themselves and to their parents, and their parents are problems to them. But actually, one of the reasons why is that parents and children have had no training, no discipline in values. How many parents today can take the Zen attitude that parenthood is a magnificent voluntary liberation through the complete fulfillment of the highest moral code of parental conduct and character? That the individual who helps his child to unfold is a far happier, wiser, better person than the individual who is trying to unfold himself. We don't realize this. We do not realize that the great release from tension is release from conscious dedication to ourselves. That is why in Zen everything is, in a sense, away from the personal. The friends gather not that each may preserve his own identity, but that each may be lost in the common good of the group that each will become Zen-like, completely detached from self, thus forming a new unit, a magnificent over-unit, probably the only democracy we will ever know, is the democracy of persons united without desire for personal advantage. So everywhere your Zen brings releases from these pressured problems. Releases through fulfillment and not through evasion. Releases by removing the energies which are used to evade with. To bring about this very great quietude of things. Now there's one other point that I think that in the early days is then mingled with Confucianism and Shintoism to produce another a very, very interesting uh, a fact in human experience. Somehow, the greatest perfection of things is uncalculated. 
the individual some way becomes greater than himself when he no longer tries to be himself. If the person simply ceases to impose his own personal feelings upon values, he suddenly achieves virtue. Virtue is therefore the natural fulfillment of things by their own natures. A man is forever interfering by his thoughts and emotions which distort rather than fulfill. So Zen producing as it does a complete letting down, we will say, restores a childlikeness in the person. A, a condition of complete relaxation in which decision is almost certain to be correct. Not because it is thought through by the ponderousness of philosophic decision, but because any decision arrived at in almost absolute quiet will be the best decision of which the individual is capable. Man's decisions are best when he ceases influencing himself. If, therefore, the whole consciousness in its impersonality moves in upon a decision, that decision is well made. <coughs> but when emotion and thought move in, with their qualifying and modifying attitude, then the decision is less correct. If in Zen, therefore, we have complete composure, if we have the individuals day by day interfering less and less with the natural functions of his own integrities, there must come the time when ceasing to make mistakes by the use of thought and emotion, the person comes very close to virtue. For well, virtue is the way of things, the way of heaven, the Chinese call it. Virtue is the inevitable law of things, moving things according to its own purpose and its own will. And when man ceases to move himself and gives up trying to move other people, he is then moved by heaven. It is hard to us for us to understand this, because we have strived, uh, we have always been striving so desperately to over-influence, to dominate, and to force, to control, and to almost imprison or restrict the rights of others. But when we relax, heaven knows best. The person who allows his complete integration to move him is best moved, and his complete integration means that no single part of him dominates the rest. He must have no allegiances to anything except quietude, except peace, and except the laws and principles which are at the source of life. Zen tells us that in the complete composure and detachment of inner tranquility, even the simplest peasant the farmer becomes the sage, that the child becomes the teacher of the man, and that some small flower without voice becomes the teacher of teachers. Everything becomes meaningful if the individual is quiet, follows the ancient admonition, be still and know that I am God. So against tension, as we know it today, is stillness. And actually, tension is the parent of ignorance, and stillness is the parent of wisdom. For it is only in stillness that we can receive, and it is only by receiving into us, into ourselves, the infinite life of things as a vast motion as a great energy that we can ever transcend the small intellectualism that we try to pass off for knowledge. So tension really locks us away from knowledge. <coughs>
and we can see that in our present world condition. As tension increases, collective judgment is impaired. In the tension of the last 25 or 50 years, our educational institutions have lost most of the name of action. In the desperate efforts to solve the problems which we have created by ignorance, we find even more ignorant solutions, and the problems get worse instead of better. Everything arising from desperation adds to the desperateness of the situation. We see around ourselves today nervous wrecks making laws, laws that are likely to make nervous wrecks of the rest of us, if we permit them to. Out of this tremendous emergency, out of the futility that is arising in us, out of the disillusionments and the discouragements, out of the loss of our natural buoyancies, out of the loss of our sense of sufficiency and security and problems, comes nothing but more trouble. We cannot, in a state of tension, ever solve our difficulties. For all we can possibly do is make emergency measures, and these are always in trying to make the problem worse. Today we look around, no one seems to have any answers. Everyone is as tired as we are, and out of the desperate conclaves of desperate persons come these measures that lead from one emergency to a worse one. It is the same in personal living. The individual under tension can practically never be right. Whatever his decisions are are poorer than they should be. And therefore, out of tension, the individual is constantly adding to his own responsibilities and burdens. He is making life more difficult as he tries to find desperate cures for it. And among the desperate cures that we are looking for, is this strange irresponsibility which is so noticeable in the present generation. Having no answers, these younger people are simply following the pattern of trying to use up life as quickly as possible, lest it slips away unused. This is no answer. Tension cannot relieve itself. The only thing it can do is destroy us and perhaps cast us out of life. We'll come back at some later time and maybe learn then. The only answer is to start immediately to depress this tension or to decrease it. Otherwise, we can never outwit the mistakes which tension causes. If, however, instead of this, we allow the quietudes in us to come through, if we allow ourselves to have a certain amount of stillness, we then become observers of things as they are. Tension is an astigmatism to the eyes. It distorts the testimony of every sensory perception. Tension prevents us from being able to read the truth in the newspaper, in the acts of other persons, in world events, or in the affairs of our own families. Well, the, the tense person cannot even recognize the facts because he has distorted his own receptive faculties. What we need, really, is, is the ability to recognize the truth in things, simple truth in daily things, more advanced truth in those rarer episodes that make up various phases of living. To discover truth, we have to relax. We have to get ourselves and our own opinions out of the way. We have to realize that we owe a greater obligation to truth than we do a loyalty to our own attitudes. In the effort to be consistent, we are only perpetuating our own mistakes. If we are unable or unwilling to face the, the tensions that we have, uh, we can pause for a moment and, and try to find out why we feel this way. Are we adequate? 
Are we really enjoying life as much as possible in the sense of peaceful growth? Are our interests greater than our prejudices in all things? Are we more inclined to be kind than we are to be critical? Are we quick to see the good in others and slow to see their faults? Are we actually looking for good or looking for faults? If we're looking for faults, then we cannot really learn much anywhere because we have destroyed the honesty of our sensory perceptions. You have to clean the house on this. Get rid of habits. Get rid of prejudices. Get rid of attitudes by which you lock yourself into false perspectives. If one by one you get rid of all these various false attitudes, you are almost certainly going to end up in a state of relaxation. You are going to find in the end that when you get rid of all of these faults, a very nice life is what is left. A very pleasant, happy existence. When you stop punishing yourself, the punishment ends. For well, you are doing it. And the moment you stop punishing yourself, and they're quiet, and receptive, and cheerful, you open the gates of vision. You become aware keenly of the universe of great joy. And you begin to see past these things. Someone will say, well, how can you see a universe of great joy at the present time? Well, the universe of great joy is there just as it always was. The only difficulty is that human beings have simply refused to keep the rules of the game. The universe is not to blame. And man, by the wonder of the universe, is going to inevitably, ultimately, redeem himself. Nothing is really wrong. The only thing that could be wrong would be to have the world as it is enjoy peace. This would prove that there is no justice. This would prove that there is nothing to hope for. Because if a world locked in its own errors can escape those errors without the correction of the cause, then we have no orderly universe. We have nothing to hope for. Our great hope is the justice that will forever decree that the wrong can never succeed. This is our real basic hope, and this is why the universe is a very good universe, even though it looks a little difficult at the moment. It is good because it is going to make us good. And it is good because at no moment in the history of this world, at any time in the past, now, or any time in the future, can any situation arise which will prevent the individual waking up when his own inner life begins to mature. There will never be a time when man cannot find inner peace and why, by so doing, find the key to the universal confusion and perhaps make his own contribution to the correction of it. So I think we have to very definitely assume the basic correctness of the Zen point of view. That by means of it, we do not build a barrier between us and life, nor do we attempt to escape our own faults and let other people suffer. Nor do we try to save our own lives at the expense of anyone else. What we are distinctly and definitely trying to do is to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. And that purpose is to understand the laws of our own creation and obey them and to realize that to the degree that we grow up ourselves, we become powerful, constructive forces in the complete program. 
If, therefore, in the course of your daily experiences, you find that you are nervous, the things are getting you, that the tendency to be critical is increasing due to the fatigue in yourself, then you have to realize that you must either accept this and be fatigued and finally exhausted and finally destroyed by your own mechanism, or else recognize that this is a symptom of maladjustment, that you are out of harmony with life. And nine times out of ten today, the individual who is out of harmony with life is out of harmony because of his own self-centeredness. That he is trying to get something for himself at the expense of life. He's trying to get happiness without giving any. He's trying to get satisfaction without really sharing. He wants friends without being a friend. He wants adulation, but he wants to criticize others. All of these things represent very unzen like attitudes. But beyond and underneath them is this wonderful fact, this absolute integrity of things which is our hope of glory at all times. This fact is the way in which cause and effect operates. That all these relationships are karmic, and that the only way to get the new attitudes is to create the causes of them in our daily living. So for the person who is under stress, if this stress is of outside things and you see no remedy for it at the moment, not having probably yet a sufficiently deep understanding of the total plan of things, then the first and most natural step is to conserve all possible energy so that you will have as much as you can have for the very important things that you feel you must do. Stop wasting on things which have no real significance. Lower your emotional tensions so that your energies will extend over your responsibilities more adequately. Learn to watch every moment against the waste of energies. Learn to automatically protect yourself against any excessive action or attitude. The moment you feel your temper rising, quietly relax it before it has a chance to arise. Buddha gives a very good little formula for this, and of course Zen is Buddhism. Buddha says, the moment you feel the slightest tendency to irritation against anyone or anything, relax completely. Drop it even before it has taken any appreciable shape in your mind. The moment you find yourself hurrying, trying desperately to achieve something that uh, may be too complicated, drop it, relax instantly. The moment you observe an attachment becoming unreasonable, don't wait until it has its full fruit of disaster. Drop it. And when I mean drop it, I do not mean that he believed that the individual should give up noble things, beautiful things, fine things, but only things which of themselves prove they are wrong because they disturb rather than ennoble life. A love that enriches is one thing. A love that disturbs is another. A love that impels to unselfishness is one thing. A love which only uh, impels to gratification of desire is another thing. Wherever it is right, it has no tension. Wherever it is tense, there is something wrong with it. So Buddha pointed out, don't wait until you're angry at the man. The moment you sense anger, the moment you say to yourself, I think I'm not going to like this chap, right. break the tension. The moment you see yourself getting tighter at the wheel and your hands holding the steering post too hard, get off the freeway. Drop it. 
don't allow yourself to be killed by dropping the wheel in the middle of the freeway. But get away from the situation. Make some change so the tension will break. Never keep letting it mount. You listen to an individual, he's saying things you don't disagree with, and you're getting more and more worked up every moment. Relax. Drop the controversy. Laugh. Smile. Take it easy. Think of something else. If it becomes unendurable, quietly withdraw. But do not allow the tension to mount. If you find some intemperance in yourself gradually sneaking up on you, the moment it presents a difficulty which you cannot immediately handle, drop it. Never let these things build. Watch yourself on politics. The moment you begin losing sleep or losing friends over politics, drop the thing. Think things through, learn the lessons, but never let tensions build. And never for a moment feel that you have the right to prevent other people from thinking according to their own light. But wherever anything disturbs composure, stop it. It is the only way to prevent these things from building. And if you prevent them from building, if you cut them off at the beginning, they will, they will never get to the point where they will endanger you. That is the Zen meditation concept. Because meditation is simply this state of mind or of consciousness in which the individual simply does not participate in excess of anything, but holds all things in quietude within himself. Quietude permits us to think, it permits us to analyze, it permits us to weigh and to truly understand. But when we find it beginning to cause us to pass too many judgments, then be careful. For as soon as we begin to think that we have right to pass judgment on every other individual, an egotistic tension is arising, and we must drop it. Always watching, until it becomes instinctive. It isn't much of a problem, really, because we know these tensions. We don't have to sit and try to find one with a microscope. We know when we're going to get angry. We feel it coming in. We know when we're irritated and disturbed. We know when the doorbell rings at the inconvenient moment. We know when the crossword is to be spoken. We know when we're going to belittle someone else. We know these things. But before they have a chance to rise within us, stop them. Relax away from them. Never let them reach maturity. Never let them reach the state of confusion. And if we can achieve this relaxation, we will then find that we can face the future with a great deal better hope. And as a reward for this dropping of self-attitude, we will probably become authorities in many other subjects. For the great student of humanity, the analyst, the news commentator, everyone who wishes to have a truly profound knowledge of facts must drop prejudice, must drop all things by which he obscures his own vision of the principles. Failure to do this means that he will have false judgment. So tension arises from all these pressures in ourselves arises from all these judgments that we try to make and the offenses that other people cause in us when they do not agree with our judgment. If we can quietly reduce the tension, then our judgments improve, our lives are happier, and we have more energy for essentials. For it is in those moments when having dropped these tensions, we are quiet for a moment, that we are at our best. And insight, inspiration, illumination, the mystical experiences, the at one moment, the cosmic consciousness, which has been talked about so much by metaphysicians down through the years. All of these exalted states, as Emmanuel Swedenborg clearly pointed out, 
most come to the individual who has found a great internal peace with God. The individual who is to receive the light of heaven must be open to it, must be relaxed and receptive. For if he is full of worldly wisdom, there is no place in him for the wisdom of God. If he is full of himself, there is no place in him for the divine. And if he is completely cluttered with his own tensions, he can scarcely be expected to experience within himself the peace of universal understanding. So as a reward for getting over ourselves, we come close to realities. And this closeness to reality frees us from tension and pressure, because when we are close to reality, we are sufficient to our needs. And when we are sufficient to our needs, there is no desperation left in us. And we are not striving for anything which requires tension. We are seeking only that which is to be found in quietude, in peace, and in insight. In these arrangements of our patterns, therefore, we come at last to the goal we seek. So our whole problem is to cure, so to say, of the tensions in ourselves by means of which we can never come to know of what is good in life or what is real in life, and by which we perpetuate sickness and sorrow for ourselves. If we can understand this, I think we can see why Zen has been so cultivated in Asia and why it is beginning to deeply interest Western psychologists. It is the only answer that we have by which the individual can clear his own consciousness by relaxing away from error. Not by fighting it, but by relaxing from it. By allowing error to go to sleep. And when it goes to sleep, that which remains is truth. For error is a cloud upon the face of truth. And if the cloud is dispelled, the truth is there. And behind all the clouds of error will be the light of truth. And the light of truth comes to us when we relax and remove the clouds of tension, pressure, and opinion with which we benight ourselves. If we can achieve these ends, we will have gained a great deal of good for ourselves and those who love us and those around us. Well, our time is up, so we thank you very much for being with us this evening.